All right, thank you all so much for coming. My name is Camille Burge. I am an associate professor in the Department of Political Science. I'm also the assistant director for the Center for Peace and Justice Education. On behalf of the Center for Peace and Justice Education and the MLK Planning Day Committee, we thank you uh, for coming out to this event today, for coming out to Freedom Schools. Um, this is our second round of sessions. We have two more, one at 1245 and the last one uh, at 220. Um, so things being offered all day. But but you're here today to hear from two very special people, uh, Danielle Burns, who is a graduate student in the Department of Political Science, and Simon Brooks, who is an undergraduate student. And this morning, they will be speaking with us from the topic, the misremembering of American history, the story of America's moral decay. And I'll turn it over to them so that they can give their presentation. Thanks again. And we look forward to interacting with you during the Q&A. All right, thank you, Dr. Birch, for that beautiful introduction. As she said, we will be discussing the misremembering of American history, the story of America's moral decay. So before we begin the presentation, I just wanna let you guys know this will be more so a conversational lecture, um, pretty informal as we kind of produce and share this information with you all. So if you have a pressing question or anything like that, put it in the chat and we'll do our best to monitor it as we go. Um, and I also want to share a little bit about the origin of our presentation and kind of how this idea for this lecture came to be. So as we know, uh, the state of America that we find ourselves in today, we often find ourselves asking questions of how we got to this point in history. How did we arrive in this era, especially academics like ourselves are con constantly asking these questions. And for a lot of us, you know, especially marginalized and oppressed groups, when we think of different intersecting identities, have found themselves asking these questions since the beginning of our lifetimes. So we kind of are looking at it as a luxury to just now be asking about the legitimacy of our, of our country's fun, uh, foundation and fundamentals. Just now asking ourselves, you know, were the founding fathers that, you know, praised equality and justice for all, were they legitimate when you had, when at this point in history, you have you had people that were owning enslaved persons. So as we go through this timeline of American history, we wanna look at the misremembering, the miseducation that we have faced throughout our education, primary and secondary, and how that has uh, caused us to go into this, prog to, into this progression of decay. So after that long introduction, uh, we're going to start this off with uh, a video of a quote by James Baldwin that could really be seen as kind of like the inspiration behind this lecture. Okay. Okay. What's your role here? And there are days, this is one of them. When you wonder what your role is in this country and what your future is in it, how precisely are you going to reconcile yourself to your situation here and how you are going to communicate to the vast, heedless, unthinking, cruel, white majority that you are here. I'm terrified at the moral apathy, the death of the heart, which is happening in my country. These people have deluded themselves for so long, they really don't think I'm human. I had basis on their conduct, not on what they say. And this means that they have become in themselves moral monsters. Okay, so back on, here we go. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. So here I have a quote by Friedrich Nietzsche, very famous philosopher and kind of like a picture collection of three symbols of periods throughout American history. So in the first picture, we have Christopher Columbus, which you know throughout our time periods and throughout our education has kind of been credited with the founding of America. 
uh, which we now know, especially as college students and faculty and staff, um, as a bit of miseducation in terms of the actual story of his history. Uh, the next picture we have is J. Edgar, excuse me, J. Edgar Hoover, who in his time period kind of believed he was, his goal was to maintain the sanctity of uh, America and his job was to do whatever was necessary in his eyes to preserve American democracy. And we have Donald Trump, which we all know now living through that time period currently credits himself with making America great again. So in this quote we have right here, it kind of questions the, the duality and the philosophy of duality. And I think here we, we ask ourselves, are we able to address the positives and the benefits of American society while also addressing America's errors? Can we address that at the same time our American founding fathers, the constitution that we praise has at the same time been oppressive to so many different groups throughout history? Okay, and Simon, if you want to take this away. Yeah, I. So you're saying that too, and it and it, it just brings to me this idea of um, of American exceptionalism, and I know we've talked about this a lot, Danielle. And it's it's mind-boggling to me um, how frequently we have people def get so defensive, and and any time we have this cycle it seems so it can be at any point in our life it, it obviously because it's lasted all the way through now with with donald trump that we're it seems as though we're making progress but we're we're really on this cycle of of justice and it's not really getting at the root um until we start acknowledging that we've been very miseducated mis mis um misled really um and, and people are not questioning it enough and not being willing to let let go of that defensive part. So when we think about, um, you know, Columbus in our history books and all these young children are, are told to, to uplift him. And then half of those children would have been killed by, by this hero, you know, it's, it's very depressing almost and think back to the tone um, of, of our video in the beginning, the, the tone, it, it's kind of this mind boggling, uh, I'm just so frustrated. So so I, this quote we have of Malcolm X though really um, puts it well. Uh, so he's speaking, we're not Americans, we're Africans who happen to be in America. We were kidnapped and brought here against our will from Africa. We did not, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. That rock landed on us. So for everyone thinking about Columbus and thinking about this story, the story was really coming from one perspective, right? The white perspective coming from this white affluent perspective in a perspective that was perfectly okay with, with telling lies to benefit themselves. Right, the like constant cycle of lying and trying to twist what's really happening in history to structure America at its fundamental level to benefit white people, to put down and oppress black people. It's, it's in the fundamental core. And even when we go in and, and try to acknowledge this, we still are met with protests and riots of people who are saying, you know, well, my grandfather fought in the, uh, you know, in this, in the South and like, I'm proud of my grandfather. It's like, why are you proud of your grandfather? Like what, why can't we get past this wall? Um, so yeah, I, I think this is very, very important for us to understand that even from the foundation of the country, how we think the country is founded, was this American exceptionalism has rotted our educational perspective. Exactly. And going off of that, I think it's important that as we 
address um, the American education system, we address the nuances and describing these stories and how we the rhetoric we, the rhetoric we use and how we address these stories uh, from history classes to government classes, how we talk about fundamental Supreme Court cases, how we talk about interviews and polling and studies that are done and the nuances behind them and the legitimacy behind the history that we've been taught. So if we look at, you know, talking about uh, the founding of America and the praise of colonialism without also addressing how the beauties of colonialism came at the expense of oppressed people, it came at the expense of enslaved persons, it came at the, at the expense of brown and bodies across the world, brown and black bodies across the world, without the duality of these conversations, we're really creating an entire new history that, you know, does not capture the story that doesn't allow us to understand how we get from point A to point B because we've left out the details of the story. Okay, so as you know, we're at a university, we're called students, staff, faculty. It's really important to look at these stories from an educational perspective. So not just talking at them from school, but from an academic perspective that places a, you know, an essential hand on critical analysis of these types of, um, these types of stories. So when we look at, you know, the Constitution, and it's saying that we are here for equality and justice for all, and then you have the Dred Scott versus Sanford, uh, versus Sanford uh, decision that says that the Constitution is not made for Black people. So you have these Supreme Court cases that are, you know, telling us that telling us that they're for the opposite of what the Constitution says. So similar to that video, James Baldwin says, I go based off of what you do and not what you say. So although we, we attempt to hold up the sanctity of the Constitution and the founding fathers, we have to go based off of the, the detailed and nuanced experiences in history rather than the quotes and phrases and the memoirs and the diaries. We really have to look at the detailed descriptions of what happened and how we got here. So that goes into uh, our next ruling of Brown v. Board of Education, which is kind of prompt up as, you know, one of the greatest, you know, rulings of all time where it says, you know, separate but not equal is not okay. Uh, but we really want to get into what, what was the reasoning for that ruling? Because if you take out that ruling, it kind of props it up that America had gotten to this place of progression, that they were against the Jim Crow South, that they were against segregation, that they were for equality, for, you know, bettering of American society, when really you look at that ruling and you get something else. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about the Brown v. Board ruling? Yeah, I was just, so Brown v. Board, I learned about this actually through a podcast with Malcolm Gladwell called Revisionist History. And I love the podcast because of this idea that he looks back at things in history that are often misunderstood or misremembered. And, um, and Brown v. Board, the ruling uh, was not that, you know, we need to desegregate schools and, and come together and unify. That's not the rationale for the, the ruling. Um, it was actually that the court stated that black children were so inferior and that they could not learn because of their blackness. They were, they were intrinsically flawed and needed the charity help, that that was why we needed to desegregate. And they, and they only desegregated with the, um, with the children and they did not desegregate the teachers or, or um, any integration that was meaningful. So you start getting more and more issues that followed. Um, and this is coming from direct accounts of you know, the Browns. Um, so I highly encourage you to, to watch the entire and listen to the entire podcast, but it's really mind boggling that it's taken until you know 2020 or 2019 when the podcast was released for someone on the mainstream to really pick up this and try to keep going. And I'm thinking that can't be it, right? So it's not, it's really that there's these generational gaps in education such that for all the people who are outraged over the subtle, more subtle and hidden uh, racist ideas that are in Brown v. Board, that doesn't get passed down. And then we get a new generation who has to now learn it and get outraged themselves. And it's this cycle you get, you know, there could be rulings, there could be things that happen in history. And we have groups of people who are outraged. And then it, it seems as though we're making progress. But in fact, it just manifests itself in different forms of oppression. 
until we relearn it and a new group tries to bring it up. And it's just frustrating over time to see that we actually haven't made as much progress as we might have thought. And it all kind of stems from this miseducation. Um, kind of goes into slavery and then you know, talk more about it, just the American constitution and slavery, like, like we think of slavery as this era in time that we've been, been able to kind of try to sell as we're getting over it or we're moving past it or let's do things to unify and, and try to move on from it. Like slavery is just at the heart of everything in our policies today. And it's, it's, not the same exact, right? We, like we, we know it's not the exact same enslaving of black and brown bodies, but it's it's the same concept of severe oppression in different systems. And those systems stem from slavery. Like you think of any wealth inequality and coming from someone who cannot make a wage because they're enslaved going up through these systems. Why are we now still having problems with drastic poverty for people of one race, right, of Black Americans, why are they so much more heavily at risk of living in poverty and being born into poverty? It's like you can draw it all the way back to slavery and all the way back to, to policing. Um, so we're really not over it in the systems. It, so, I don't know why people keep, keep discussing it as if we're like in this new era when the systems are in this new era are all representative of our sy systems from slavery. Right. And going off of what Simon says in terms of looking at slavery in the American Constitution, uh, you know, there's a famous quote that talks about, you know, we must teach and learn history so that history does not repeat itself. So that begs the question, if we're not teaching history accurately, we're kind of leaving open the door to repeat these errors of society. So we're not teaching the ills, the violent history, the violent nature of um, the American past. We're leaving space. Um, for you know the violent nature of this past presidency to come up again we're asking ourselves how did we get this haven't we moved past this but if we're not teaching you know the youth if we're not you know rectifying our past as we go on we're not leaving the space for progress you know it, it there's this idea that, you know, the progress in America has been extremely one sided and it's been one sided in terms of the oppressor and not in terms of moral progress. It's not that we are more morally just today than we were during Jim Crow and segregation or more morally just today than we were, you know, during slavery. There were people back then that knew that this was wrong. There's this idea that, you know, uh, Americans had to dehumanize their slaves. And I think I think of that as in a way a scapegoat because it gives this idea that, you know, these humans in no way could have done that to another human. In no way could they have saw this black individual as a human and still did that. We have to address it for what it is as there was a point in time in a society, you know, that people were harming their neighbors. And it's important to address that for what it is and to use the proper language in terms of his, historical rhetoric that allows us to really understand what has happened so that we can move forward. As long as you know we kind of dance around that timeline, it doesn't really give us any space or the opportunity to make progress there. And you know, Chris Rock, he, he says it wonderfully uh, when he talks about civil rights movies and how we, how we uh, present civil rights to the youth and to people growing up and they kind of present it at, as a way that it's very fixable, you know, as racism is just, you know, there's, there's just very few white people out there that just happen to not like black people or they're just a little rude or they just don't want to sit next to them at some tables or they want to drink out of different water fountains. There's a, there's founda there's a foundation behind the racism that we see in America and there's a concrete reason as to why persist into why it has been beneficial and why it has been preserved over centuries. So we're going to take a look at uh, this quote by Chris Rock very quickly. That face okay. that is usually okay. Okay. All civil rights movies. <laughs> what? I, 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 
There we go. There we go. Are you seeing the video, Simon? Yes, it's a little blurry, but that might change when you play it. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, I can see it now. Thank you. Like, I hate all civil rights movies. Don't get me wrong. I, I applaud the effort. Right. And, and they should exist. The problem is they only show the back of the bus and the lunch counter. They mm. actually make racism look very, like, fixable. <laughs> right. right. And they yeah. don't really get into how dysfunctional the, the, the relationships were. And, like, in the 40s and 50s, like, white men would just walk in your house and take your food. You know, like... What? Yeah, they would just come into your house. They wouldn't knock. What do you think they would happen in the during the depression when people are hungry oh, and white like, people are still... hungry and and like oh, there's black people cooking on that side of town. What, what, what do you think would happen? They would walk in your house and take your yeah. It's shit. like a predator prey relationship. It's a predator prey relationship. What do you think, white guys? What do you think when it was time to rape, they were just rape. They were raping white women. No, they would go and rape the women they could actually rape without going to jail for. Her. Okay? Or sexual assault, just like, you know, guys and all that shit. You know, all that shit. This shit is so much more, um, you know, racism and Jim Crow is so much dirtier mm. than any movie ever shows. It's in, it's in... Think about that too, Danielle, in that quote, and just how the media really functions as another form of education. So we think about media as its own sector, almost like its own economic sector, its own industry. Um, you know, but we all get educated through media, uh, whether it's through movies or news stories or articles. And it's, it's kind of like it's this universal classroom of sorts for anyone who has access to media you know that's a lot of where the growth comes especially once you're out of formal education you know unless you decide to take course yourself you're learning a lot about current events through media and there's this history be because of the fact that media is is historically controlled to tell the white narrative there's this history of excusing racism, excusing sexism, and, and providing a lot of excuses along the way from the forefathers, from, from any, like the, the people that we try to change the narratives of that Danielle and I are hoping people like are able to learn these things and look at education in a different perspective. It's almost like there's education in the formal sense, but then there's also this media that we need to combat as well. Of how do we look into these stories, and how do we, how do we make sure that what is presented as, as factual isn't actually just this whitewashed version of history, and, and not falling into that trap when we're when we're looking back and going through. It could be movies, it could be, you know, anything. But there's a harsh reality, and it seems like people don't want to admit how harsh uh, that reality really is of how black people are really treated. I, I'm not gonna say we're treated because it really is still going on today, of how black people are treated in this country and why there is such an excuse when it, when it comes. There's always, you know, black lives matter. Well, let's think of blue lives matter, all lives matter. There's always some sort of combative association and that is a form of education. People, that's how people get their information. They're going to get miseducated in the media as well. Okay. Uh, so here's a quote by famous musician Nina Simone, where she says, slavery has never been abolished from America's way of thinking. And this quote comes from her being interviewed and they're asking her about freedom and for the state of the Negro in America. Uh, she was someone like James Baldwin that, you know, traveled in and out of the United States and they both uh, have talked about their experiences being Black in America and being Black abroad. Um, so as we talk about, you know, history today, how we talk about history and how we talk about the present day, it's important to remember that, you know, 
the ills that we talk about have been preserved. They may not seem as that they may not seem as violent and as brutal as slavery, but they are still happening today and that violence continues today. So when we look at, you know, preservation through transformation, so what does that mean? If we can go from vagrancy laws to black codes, to Jim Crow, to the war on crime, to the war on drugs, to the prison industrial complex, to the criminalization of protesting, you can see that even though, you know, those chains may not be as visible as they were during slavery, they're still there. So, you know, even though we don't have Jim Crow segregation, we see redlining, even though we don't have vagrancy laws, we see mass incarceration continuing to increase, um, even though we don't have segregation in schools, we have admission based on merit, which really disenfranchises a specific group. And the thing is, the way that we've preserved racism and discrimination has been, you know, so implicit, it's so hard to see it unless you pull it out. And the, the kind of the purpose here, when we're talking about miseducation, miseducation happens, you know, when we leave holes in the story. So if we talk about in terms of college education, if we talk about being a merit-based institution and we talk about, you know, priding ourselves on high standardized testing, we're leaving out a specific group of people and we don't talk about the history of a standardized testing and the history of how these types of tests and how we look at merit disenfranchise and, and discriminates from a group. We look at professionalism and how the implicit, you know, nuances of professionalism is based in whiteness. There's so many different ways that how we look at society, you know, without looking at the nuances of how we get from point A to B, we're always leaving, you know, we're moving the opportunity for us to make that progress because we don't understand. So I, just, go ahead, Simon. Can I add to that? I just, it, there's connections here that I think people might not realize that there are holes in this story sometimes too. And I feel like that there, there are connections that for some reason, well, it's not for some reason, it's because it, you know, if, if white people or white men in power show these connections and are willing to educate about them, then it really reveals a lot of the oppression they're doing. So it, I, I think it's, you know, purposefully withheld from education. But for example, one, one is, um, you know, not a lot of people know that 88% of lawyers are white and 95% of prosecutors are white. 79% prosecutors being white men and, and they get, they run unopposed, um, like around 95% of them run unopposed to become reelected. And that, you know, affects heavily the war on crime, the war on drugs, prison industrial complex. Who are these prosecutors? Who are the lawyers, right? You look at the prosecutors a lot, like mostly what happens is a lawyer becomes a prosecutor. They work to a certain extent and they can, they can run and get the qualification. Well, when you're taking from a pool of 88% white lawyers, then you're gonna continue the cycle of oppression when they become prosecutors. And when you look at education then, we need to figure out a way of how we can get more diverse lawyers, right? How do we get black abled people who want to become lawyers? How do we get them into our system to break down the oppression that's rooted in our system? And it, a lot of the barriers are educational. So you think of standardized testing, you think of the LSAT, you think of you know what types of people are being let into law school itself, that's going to contribute you know, heavily into the lawyers and who are at the admissions boards of these law schools or of education boards in general. It, everything is connected in ways that we might not necessarily be taught about, but it's important that we can't just stand for part of it, right? We can't just say, oh, the war on drugs is very bad. I'm not for that, but I'm all for full standardized testing or that I, I do not like you know, how many people we have in prison, but you shouldn't just be able to loot and riot and get away with it. Like lock them up too. You know, like you can't pick and choose which racist ideology you want to support and which one you, you don't. You have to be consistent. And for a lot of people, they, they might think they're consistent, but it's really miseducation and in ignorance to the fact that they're indirectly or directly supporting a system of oppression um, that can negate a lot of what good work they might think they're doing against other systems. Right. 
Thank you for that, Simon. Okay. Uh, so a lot of quotes today who are coming uh, with another quote from Malcolm X, uh, where he says, if violence is wrong in America, violence is wrong abroad. If it is wrong to be violent defending black women and black children and black babies and black men, then it is wrong for America to draft us and make us violent abroad in defense of her. And if it is right for America to draft us and teach us how to be violent in defense of her, then it is right for you and me to do whatever is necessary to defend our own people right here in this country. So it kind of goes really just off of what Simon said. So in terms of the recent protests and riots in America, you know, like Simon said, there's a lot of people that were saying, I'm against injustice, but I don't want you to fight it this way. I'm, a, I'm against police brutality and I'm against, I'm against the killing of your people, but I would prefer if you were just a little bit more quiet in your protest, or I'd prefer if you didn't block the roads while you were fighting for your freedoms. So it's important to look at when you're, you know, rejecting freedom for another person, you kind of have to reevaluate and look at yourself into why is it that I am okay with this, this sense of duality that, you know, two, these two things, it's okay for them to exist at the same time where, you know, as Americans, it seems like we're okay setting timetables for people's freedom. So instead of saying, you know, you're not free, let me contribute uh, to your freedom and let me contribute to your liberation, you know, we've said, you know, not everything happens overnight. And I think it's important if you can come from a place where that is not your reality, that is a luxury. If you can come from a place where your, you know, humanity, your legitimacy as a citizen, your uh, liberation is being debated during presidential elections. If that's not the case, that is a luxury. You know, it's very important to look at uh, our own identities. When we think about intersectionality and intersecting identities and how that plays into the intersex, the intersecting of our sources of oppression, what does that do to our perspective on American reality? So he talks about the violence uh, abroad versus the violence in America and the criminalization of peaceful protesting in America, the criminalization of the civil rights movement. Because now in textbooks, there's kind of, like Simon said earlier, this revisionist history of you know really praising Dr. King and really praising him as this great American symbol. And at the time he was the most hated man in America. He was not liked by white people. He was not liked by society. And we have this idea now. He's in every textbook. You know, he's probably the most household name. He gets talked about probably as much as the founding fathers, but that idea rewrites history. And it gives this idea that most Americans were for equality. Most Americans were for justice for people of color when that is not the case. And if, without addressing that, you have, you know, uh, younger white Americans saying, how did we get here? You have, you know, white Americans saying, uh, this is not America. This is not what America stands for, With this, which is just historically inaccurate, because if anything, it is. When we look at history, we've seen uh, continuity and oppression. It's like in the last slide, it talks about the preservation. So maybe the racism isn't as salient but classism is. So if we wanna talk about historical oppression through American capitalism versus mass incarceration, the prison industrial complex, uh, all of those things are intertwined. So like Simon said, it's really difficult to make sense of picking and choosing which oppression you're against. Um, because most likely if you're, you know, if we're talking about, I love the freedoms that we get from American capitalism, and note that I'm saying American capitalism for Dr. Kors are watching. Uh, when we're looking at American capitalism, uh, it's really important to talk about at whose expense are we given those benefits? Are the benefits of American society, do they come at the expense of black and brown bodies uh, domestically and abroad? So we're gonna keep going there, long run. Yeah, and, and I just have, um, I have something too. Um, off of that point that I wanted to ask actually the people just either show of hands or the raise your hand participant, but how many of you personally hold or know someone who holds the political identity of fiscally conservative, but socially liberal? People heard that. I see some hands going up. Yes. Okay. Many more hands are starting to go up. So, I, I first heard that term um, 
at Villanova, right, fittingly enough, where people want to identify with how you can, you can be all for this anti-racism concept and you're going and trying to, trying to sell yourself to people as this really progressive liberal person for social policy and justice. But if you also try to identify with fiscally conservative, you, you might think that it's perfectly fine in terms of your, your, and I'm not trying to come at anyone's identity part of it, but you really should re-examine it, why you hold that, what has given you that turn and, and what kind of, um, you know, what kind of responsibilities you might have in terms of when you support fiscally conservative policies that also oppress the people you're trying to socially um, uplift, right? So if you're for a fiscally conservative policy that allows for the continual oppression of people who cannot get out of poverty because of the wealth gap, and they cannot afford health insurance because of their poverty, and they cannot go get you know any proper um, education because it's all rooted in wealth inequality and redlining, forcing people in districts from the past. And all of a sudden you start to realize there's a system in place. There's like two Americas. There's one that's fast track from, you know, for white people to, to get an education and to benefit from these fiscally conservative policies. And then there's one for people who are not white in America who cannot ever get out of this fiscally conservative oppression unless we change our, our economic policies as well. We cannot try to liberate people and, and give them social freedom without also giving them money and giving them a quality of life fiscally, you know, financially for their children, for food. You can't choose between healthcare and food and also claim freedom from police brutality. You know, there's, you need to, to look at this whole picture and I'm really not trying to trying to attack anyone uh, who has the, this identity or this political um, ideology, but I do want you to consider what you've been taught and why that might be a proper thing to to believe, and potentially how that might be disguising uh, some oppression in our country. Okay, thank you for that, Simon. Okay, and that I think that. It's perfect. It brings us into Dr. King, who talks about this a lot, which uh, a lot of those quotes where he talks about what you just said, don't get brought up on Martin Luther King Day. Uh, you usually only see a couple of quotes by Martin Luther King when he gets talked about and kind of thinking of a theme for this uh, this lecture, the, really the whitewashing of the civil rights movement and especially Dr. King when we see, you know, I have a dream is the most uh, is the most popular speech by Dr. King when in reality, you know, that's probably uh, one of his more uh, subtle speeches instead, um, other than looking at I've been to the mountaintop or other speeches where he kind of or where he talks about, you know, like kind of the ills of capitalism, the ills of how our economy works in society. Um, but going based off of this quote here, it kind of talks about our earlier points into kind of like this uh, contradicting personality or this contradicting of um, political identity. So when we're thinking of what does it mean to be a moderate? What does it mean to be a centrist? What does it mean to be right wing or left wing? You know, we've, especially as we get older and speaking to the students here, we're trying to form our identities, trying to form our views. What do we value? What do we believe in? Uh, especially, you know, this past summer, we've had to question, you know, what side of history will we be on? What what side, it seems like people are asking themselves, are they going to fight for? And I think this, this quote is very, it, it holds a lot of weight when Dr. King says, I've almost reached the, regret the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's greatest stumbling block in his shrug toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. So as we've talked about, uh, you know, 
the presence of injustice in terms of oppression. Uh, I remember when I was a child, my father who grew up in Oakland around the era of the Black Panthers, he always told me, you know, he, he wasn't worried about the open racists. He wasn't worried about, you know, the people in the hoods because he knew what they were. He knew what they stood for and he knew how to navigate that. What he worried about was the person that would smile in his face, but voted for racist policies behind it behind his back. So what his worry, the same as this quote, is the white moderate. You know, the person in your class, you know, that is saying, you know, I understand that this is wrong, but we have to think about America, but without thinking about the people that occupy it and thinking of America on occupied land. So we have to really think about what do we what do we mean uh, when we're talking about these issues? What do we mean when we're saying socially liberal and fiscally conservative? And I think Simon said that really well. Uh, you know, it's really hard to be fisc fiscally conservative and thinking of these things while those policies, you know, are a detriment to social liberation for marginalized groups of people. Uh, so we just keep this quote in mind as we go throughout this presentation. Yes, okay. in, in, in the interest of in the interest of time, I, I think we might not show this Kimberly Jones video, but I do think um, it is very important for everyone to watch um, at some point, and, and I highly recommend watching it, you know, immediately following this talk, um, if you can, but basically talking about, you know, at, at some point, a quote I'll bring out is just this idea that for her, it, you know, for Black people in America, they don't actually own these stores that people are complaining about the looting and the Black Lives Matter protests. It's it's not that they own, they're not destroying this property that they own. They don't own any of this. It, this system is not benefiting them at all. And it's a perspective, really big perspective change for anyone who hasn't seen this, to think about, think about what you, owe people and what you own in America. And I know Danielle can talk more about what we might owe people to, to connect to other slides here too, but but what do we own? What's ours? What's made for us? You know, if the constitution is not made for black people, then why is the target down the street made for black people or the or the police that has proven to not be made for black people? Why would we all of a sudden just trust that it is? You know, this this ask there's a con consistent ask for the most vulnerable to all of a sudden become trusting and to, to believe that, you know, this time we're really trying to do something good and you have to believe us, we're on your side. It, it's perfectly reasonable and we should not get mad when people do not trust, you know, white people in power. When black people do not trust white people in power, that is perfectly understandable. Um, because like, how do we know if they, they really do have a conscience when everything they've done has shown in the past that you know, they really don't have a conscience, or if they do, they're actively choosing the violence and oppression of, against Black people. Like, what, how can we expect, and why do we put the burden on the, the people being oppressed to try to change things? Uh, I think it goes really well into this quote. Um, D Daniel, do you want to, do you want to read this quote? Uh, sure. So this uh, quote is by Stokely Carmichael, now known as Kwame Ter, where uh, he says, Dr. King's policy was, if you are nonviolent, if you suffer, your opponent will see your suffering and will be moved to change his heart. That's very good. He only made one fallacious assumption. In order for nonviolence to work, your opponent must have a conscience. The United States has none. And if this is your first time hearing this quote, I'm sure it's a wow to you. But what he talks about is there there were many civil rights activists and leaders that were in opposition to Dr. King's method. He was not the end all be all when it came to the to civil rights in terms of nonviolent protesting, or, uh, you know, doing walks or speeches or movements, things like that. There were other activists out there that, you know, we're not taught about. And that goes into the miseducation. So not, you know, addressing a Malcolm X or Kwame Tura, or Medgar Evers, not addressing you know these influential civil rights leaders that you know played a huge role in making progress today kind of gives us to this idea that all we have is dr king's methods so what he talks about here in terms of in order for nonviolence to work your opponent must have a, have a conscience so when we're thinking about protest and how we got from uh you know so-called peaceful protest uh peaceful protesting to riots and you know burning of buildings you know the 
the protests and riots didn't really get attention until you saw the first burning of the target after George Floyd, until you saw, you know, the destruction of property. You know, when you live in a capitalistic society, property has weight. It has benefited, produces profit. So, you know, those things are alarming and they gain attention. And you saw on the news, you know, you, you more saw the riots than you saw the peaceful protesting. So it goes to show throughout history, what have we been shown is beneficial for the, in, the individual to do, for the occupants of a state to do? And then what do we see that state do? So if America tells us, you know, we need to be nonviolent when we're fighting for our freedoms and we're fighting uh, to stop our oppression, but abroad, as you know, Malcolm X said earlier in the presentation, America is showing us violence. America is showing us different ways. There's a contradiction of uh, American morality that's on display. Okay, so looking at this from uh, historical perspectives, we went from educational now, looking back from historical perspectives. Um, so we look at racial progress. There, we've been told, you know, racial progress. We, we saw Barack Obama. Barack Obama became president of the United States. How does racism exist if a black man can become president? Uh, you know, um, Carol Anderson does a really good job in her book, White Rage, where she talks about how racial progress is almost always met with right resistance. So you got President Barack Obama, and following that, you get a President Donald Trump. So when you get, you know, um, reconstruction and you get those things, you see black massacres, you see this pushback after black progress that there's always this kind of, there's just pushback on progress um, from the side of the oppressors. Um, this is another quote by Chris Rock uh, that we thought uh, was a value where he talks about it's only progress for the person that's taking your humanity. So again, when we're looking at this progress being one sided and who benefits from this progress, he goes on to say, if a woman is in an abusive relationship and her husband stops beating her, you wouldn't say she's made progress, right? But that's what we do with black people. We're constantly told that we're making progress, he says. The relationship we're in, the arranged marriage that we're in, it's that we're getting beat less. You know, so we really have to pay attention to when we're talking about racial progress, so when we're talking about the positives of America, you have to look who is that progress at the expense of. Okay, and we, we talked about this a little bit, so for the sake of time, we're gonna go over this one. Um, again, on progress, as we go through this idea of miseducation, how we can progress, uh, we look at this other quote from Malcolm X who says, if you stick a knife nine inches into my back and pull it out three inches, that is not progress. Even if you pull it all the way out, that is still not progress. Progress is healing the wound and America hasn't even begun to pull out the knife. So when we're thinking of progress, this idea of unlearning the miseducation that we've been presented is the only way to really foster the progress, the legitimate progress that we speak of. For us to actually acknowledge that that knife is there that he speaks of, we have to know what we're dealing with. I think it's really hard for us as students, as faculty in higher education to have these important discussions if we're not all coming from a common place of knowledge of what we believe American history to be. Okay, so uh, go ahead, Simon. Yeah, I, I mean, I just, I think that's very valuable. And I know I already kind of touched on this um, because I felt the thing I thought it was fitting at the time um, to bring it up, but I, I do just think, you know, where we draw the line, where do we, where do we see ourselves as taking part in these systems that are oppressive and miseducating, whether it's through media or through formal education at Villanova here, um, you know, or just conversations you have with people, like what type of conversations are you having? What type of perspectives are you open to? You know, and, and are you willing to admit that potentially you, right, have been misled, miseducated in your history, in your education, or even from your family, right? Like, like you might revere some people in your family of being great American heroes. Oh, it's my automatic light, sorry. Uh, you might revere some some people in your in your history uh, of your family being great American heroes, but but maybe you have to take a step and realize that you know, the, hip the hypocrisy that is embedded in America, that it's so deeply that you might need to, to, to consider where you are and how to get away from it. You know, we're, we would rather live right now in a country, collectively, it's proven that we'd rather live in a country that makes it possible for the idea of becoming a billionaire, right? than educating children, than giving children food to eat, 
you know, then taking these ideas of you know, these constructs really uh, that are oppressive in nature and really getting at them head on. We would rather keep everything just for the concept to be, you know, let's make a lot of money, let's be a world leader and billionaires and military. And why? Like, where are our priorities? You know, as a country, if that's what it is, if if it's if we can't knock down a federal, you know, uh, a statue of some Confederate general, you know, or rename something after that's rooted in bigotry and hatred, if we can't even agree to rename it, right? Why? Where does that come from? And what hypocrisy are we showing when when we're trying to to, to generate this next? level of improvement and progress and and how do we prevent ourselves from cycling and, and just going on another cycle right we have to break the cycle somehow and and i think that's kind of what we're getting at here towards the end of, of what can we do what how can we empower each other and ourselves to actively unlearn uh actively unlearn what you know these problematic oppressive views um right so thank you for that simon and uh, as we review this timeline and as we wrap up, we have a couple of just topics to review and then questions to ask. So uh, reviewing this literature and preparing for this presentation, I, I found this really interesting that it seems like we're trapped between what we would like to be and what we actually are in America. And we are kind of dealing with that duality because we don't really know what we are. We think we're something, but you know, we really haven't uh, reflected enough or had enough critical analysis to address what we really are as a society. What does it really mean to be American? Um, as often scholars ask themselves, what does it mean to be white? What is whiteness? What is blackness in America? What are these things? And until we understand them and until we understand the uh, converging identities and the different aspects and the power hierarchies that was on the last slide. Uh, what what does that mean? And you know, it says we cannot live the lives we would like to without questioning our own history, without a critical analysis and looking at a historical through a historical lens of American society. Can we truly be what Americans think and say we are? So from the basis of this presentation, our goal was to kind of present this idea. Uh, you know, that we have to unlearn this miseducation. We have to unlearn these ideals that have been presented to us that are really fostering misinformation, that are really fostering this idea of, you know, an incoherent uh, American timeline. Uh, so we look at this, so it's, we find it's really important for you to question what you learn and what you have learned. So as you go through the rest of your education, or even as an educator, as a staff, when whatever you do, question the stuff that we're looking at, question you know the viability of uh, what we read, the legitimacy of what we read. Um, when we look at how do we get from point A to B, looking at timelines and how we got there, nothing you know just happens in history. Uh, there's a whole field called history and it's important because we know that the history of things have value and they allow us to predict and to look at the future. Uh, we think it's also important to talk about accountability uh, and you know where should we place accountability where is the responsibility on making these progressions and especially like Simon said uh, what do we owe each other. Uh, that's an important question that we have to ask, especially when doing this type of research and doing this type of unlearning. Uh, you know, I believe we owe it to each other to understand, you know, the different sources of oppression that we find in American society. We owe it to each other to understand power hierarchies and how we to, how we contribute to those power hierarchies, whether it be from class privilege or racial privilege. Uh, you know, we owe it to each other to dismantle these systems and sources of oppression that are still weighing on oppressed and marginalized groups across the world you know what do we owe it what do we owe to people abroad as americans um and dis, we also believe in dismantling you know the prospects of american exceptionalism dismantling this idea that you know we aren't subject to the same ills and errors as you know uh, other countries and other states and then lastly, our main goal, you know, is to tell everyone, you know, that's paying attention and listening to this to become active unlearners of American history, which kind of sounds a little crazy on the front, but, you know, after you've learned something, you know, going back and doing that self work yourself and saying, you know, that actually isn't right, that actually isn't just. 
And if I learned this at a very young and developmental age, there's probably some self work that I need to do to have to unwind those biases that I learned with it. Uh, you know, Jane Elliott says, she assumes that most people that grow up in an American education system have racist ideologies. And her interviewer, you know, was confused and saying, you know, not all Americans are racist, but she was saying, if you've grown up and you've only seen the side of history that's written by the victor, you've only seen the side of history that's written by the winner, that's written by the people that have committed these ills, it's almost impossible for you to truly understand the full picture. And in that, it's impossible to really, you know, have a uh, diversified and justified understanding of society. Uh, yeah, so no, yeah, thank you. No, thank you, Danielle. And and I really just want to take the last minute here to thank Danielle for, for coming to me with, um, you know, just hitting me up in the fall being like, yo, we should do a freedom school. We really got something here. We got to, we got to share this. And I think, I think it really takes, you know, leaders. We have to, we have to get the next generation of leaders and think about a sustainable framework, right? If we want our country to really grow and it needs to be sustainable, meaning the next generation and generations after need to have some footing where they can make progress. We cannot continue this cycle. You know, I, we, we really think that these are, are the next steps that we all need to, to take on individually and really hold our systems accountable with it. You know, when we, when we educate the next prosecutor or when we educate the next president, right? Someone is going to educate them. Some, they're gonna be a part of a family. They're gonna have environmental, you know, context and, and things that affect, you know, greatly affect how they understand their role in America. They need to understand what's come before and they need to have an accurate, uh, you know, education as accurate as we can get um, in, in for that to be the case, we need as educators and as people becoming, you know, being educated, we need to become active on learners, a really big point. Um, but thank you, Danielle. And, and I know we have a couple minutes left and I definitely want to open it up to any questions, any burning questions you have for us. Um, and we can stay on a little bit afterwards as to if, if anyone else wants to engage in more dialogue with us for as much time as we have available. But thank you so much for for everyone coming and I hope that uh, I hope that this was thought provoking for you and, and that you were able to, to take some ideas from this and implement them in your life, in your classroom, um, you know, at Villanova, in your house, anywhere that's possible. I thank you so much. Questions? Future Professor Danielle, I love it. Oh, you peeped. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Any questions yeah. or comments? Questions or comments? And also, thank you for me as well. Thank you guys all for participating. I'm very happy that we got to share this information. Um, so yeah, let me know or let us know if you guys have any questions or comments in the last couple of minutes. You could put them in the chat too. Okay, Dr. Croizer, you had your hand raised. <laughs> Sorry, thanks very much. This was really interesting. Um, so, I mean, to the extent that you make an argument about, you know, how, how we sort of misremember our past or, 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 or how we tell our past, you know, has, has uh, leaves out a lot of things. Um, did you notice, are there some differences? I mean, if you take a history course, do you get a more accurate version of the past than if you take a sociology course or a political science course? I mean, which, I mean, you, you, your sort of was a call for action, right? I mean, get to know your, your, your past a little bit better. Um, which disciplines, in your opinion, are doing a better job than others? Interesting question. Interesting question. Um, I'll, I'll say this: I think that in every discipline, you're getting uh, you're getting a timeline from a different perspective, and I think that it's important to piece those together to gain a more complete picture. Um, I think, in my experience, not to pat our department on the back, uh, I think that in some courses they've done a really good job. You know, if I think departments that center intersectionality have done a better job of gaining a more complete timeline and a more complete history. Um, in my experience, um, I've taken classes that have had that focus on, um, on creating a more complete history. So of course, 
Professor Giesberg within the history department, she addresses uh, the five different takes that histor that histori uh, historians, historians, excuse me, look at when they're trying to complete a timeline. Um, so it's looking at context, character, um, conceptualizing what's going on. So I'd say, in my experience, probably uh, the field of history um, because they look at five different um, subjects before putting together one timeline. Um, yeah. I, and um, and I would I would agree, um, but I would also say it really depends on the professor and the professor's impact in the classroom is unmatched, right? If you have a really strong professor and strong leader, um, that does so much more than a curriculum that might be better designed on paper. I think I, I think it, it makes a big difference. There's one, I mean, you know, I, I'm particularly familiar with German history that has, you know, just as dark as a past as, as, as American history. And one of the takeaway lessons for Germans is that they are proud not to be proud. Yes. Right? Yes. I think that's sort of a nice way of, 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 of putting it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and great job, guys. Thanks. Thank you. And, and I, I see Cliff raised his hand too and we have before that someone in the chat samantha put in to you all where does the unlearning of american history begin and i would say um it begins with each of us but it really begins with getting a, on a large scale as many people who hold positions of power it to hold them accountable to get them to understand more um, i think education and then industry and politics there's a big divide it seems as though a lot of people get educated and, and there's a lot of great things, but then there's also this world out there that controls the economy, that controls like so much more in power. And there needs to be a better connection between unlearning in the classroom and then really unlearning and recognizing and changing policy and taking it into action in our in our systems and our really broken systems. So um, I would say it starts with with each of us, but it really starts with us you know, vowing to take these into the workplace and vowing to spread the word. And and there's not one thing I would try to particularly unlearn first. It would just be a mindset shift, asking why we've learned this and things like that. And it starts with each of us and it starts with bringing it and branching it out from just the classroom into the industry, into the oppressive systems that exist. Uh, Cliff. Yeah, thank you. Um... I have like a comment slash question that I'd like to hear y'all's thoughts on because I feel that um I feel that as much as like the content of our educational system is altered um intentionally, I feel like we can even see um how the structure of our education system is meant to um disenfranchise people with I guess like like what are y'all's thoughts on like how the American education system structures the relationship between professors and students or teachers and students. And um, I guess as much as the, uh, the power differences in America with other countries and other like marginalized groups, like the power differences between, like power differences within a classroom. Um, that's a really interesting question and I hope I can answer it. Um, I think that when we look at, so this entire presentation was talking about misremembering and miseducation. I think that it's important to talk about how majority of that is intentional. So when we're thinking about the relationship between, uh, you know, professors and teachers and kind of like a power discrepancy, um, it's intentional that, you know, when we talk, when we talk about these things, the history has changed intentionally. It wasn't like one teacher decided, you know, it'd be really nice if we said Christopher Columbus did this when he really didn't. It's right. intentional and it comes from the top. When we think of power hierarchies, it's important to look at how these sources of impression of oppressions are intertwined. So we can talk about, you know, racial discrimination, economic disparities, but also educational gaps and also revisionist histories. They're all combined and they come from the same source. Um, so I think that that kind of goes into the sense of where does that miseducation come from and why we have these power discrepancies. So it, it was really important for me and Simon to have this lecture be a little bit more conversational uh, between us so that, you know, we're kind of normalizing that idea of 
you know, it's not me telling you this is this. It's me, you know, uh, kind of giving you that nudge for you to fall into what you believe to be active on learning. I think that that's really important in education. I think my uh, most influential classes with some of my professors being on this call, uh, they really gave that space for you to take on what you were learning, uh, for you to um, really dive into the prompts and dive into the readings and the topics that we discuss. Um, it gives you more space to really find out what you believe instead of falling into um, what just simply what a textbook says or simply what an author has presented. I think the best educators are the ones that say, how do you disagree with the author? How do you uh, look at what they said? What critiques do you have of this lesson? What critiques do you have of me? I, I think, again, not to pat myself on the back for the political science department, um, but I think I see it a lot in my, in my courses that you know it's really giving the space for you to develop your own perceptions um, and not to rant too long on this, but I'll wrap it up. Uh, something that we say uh, in terms of graduate classes, at some point you're a consumer of knowledge. And after you've reached a certain point, you wanna be a producer of knowledge. And I think that's where unlearning comes in. Uh, unlearning is very similar to producing knowledge. You're unlearning what society has told you to be true and deciding for yourself. Not that you're just not believing anything, we're not there. But for you, for deciding yourself, you know, how accurate is uh, the information that I'm being told? Yeah, and if I could add to that too, I'd like to think about it in a different, uh, a little bit of a different frame set too, because I, I stand by everything that Danielle just said. Um, but also thinking about it like, uh, you know, within colonialism, and like rooted values in our history, we talk about the moral decay right we've had these moral ideas a lot of professors hold these moral ideas um because it, to some extent they're in a position of power i mean it, relatively speaking they might not be in a very large position of power depending on where they're teaching but in the classroom they hold the authority um and and there are a lot of professors who will teach certain things because that is actually the way in which they benefit. So an example would be say, uh, say there's a, a system right uh, in place like what we have today in, in where success and achievement and, um, and stepping on, you know, climbing the corporate ladder, like, like those are really big things. People, people try to push success, you try to push achievement. If you're in a, in a classroom as a professor and you're actively, you know, perpetuating that in terms of the way this the class is structured. In terms of that, that is, it could be intentional. I, I believe it to be, or it could be accidental. Just in terms of, well, I grew up that way, and I'm able to succeed. And if I was able to go through the entire tragedy of American education as it was, and I turned out great, and I'm succeeding fine, then I believe that the system is good enough where I should should preach that to my to my students and that's a problem where you take personal biases of if you're able to succeed in a system to then try to preach that system as as good rather than recognizing you know maybe it isn't good to feed our children you know if, if i got beat as a child maybe i shouldn't eat my child just because i got beat and i turned out fine it's the same idea if if i was pressured into you know becoming a part of an oppressive system in order to make money and i took a corporate job and i turned a blind eye to racism in the office you know and i i actively was told to not choose this candidate because they were black and i listened to them and i got a pay pay bump for it and then i'm teaching later in life and my students ask me about certain things if i'm if i'm going to continuously preach that one way of being because it worked for me then i am an active presser you know, perpetuating this idea, you might not realize it, but as a leader, you have a, a fine line between being a leader and an oppressor. And you have to recognize at which point you can humble yourself and, 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 and take a step back from the system. Because I really do think the American education system is, is in place right now to not just breed miseducated students, but breed a, a generation of miseducated educators because those students become teachers. Uh, if that makes sense. So it, it takes, it, I don't know, it takes a lot. Daniel, I see you smiling. Hopefully this is resonating. I like that quote. Too. I like that quote. I'm going to write that down. I like okay. That. Cool, cool, cool. cool. <laughs> um, no, that was really good. Um, Aaron. Aaron. From Aaron that says, 
Can you speak to employing these unlearning lessons of history and social justice within areas such as STEM, where it is commonly stated that these subjects are, are objective and not biased? I actually think that's a really interesting question. I thank you for asking it. Um, I think that especially in college, and I'm in political science, so not necessarily um, STEM, but uh, we often talk about, you know, re-entering humanity into the discussion. So a lot of times, especially in college, we're looking at statistics, we're looking at numbers, we're doing quantitative research methods. It really takes the humanity out of subjects. And I think what you know we have to do when we're looking at sciences or engineering or you know, especially like within the business school that that number is a person. So you know it, it's so easy to dehumanize people without even recognizing it. It really is in terms of uh, rhetoric and how we look at and how we analyze data. Um, I, I, I'm, I do a lot of research now and I think it's important that we don't just always do quantitative measures, that we look at qualitative and we look at ethnography and uh, different types of research so that, you know, you're remembering how to reinsert the humanity into a discussion. So uh, I, don't, I don't know if that necessarily answered your question, but I think that uh, maybe Simon, you're, you're in STEM. I, I am in STEM, yeah. And what first came to mind was within the classroom, but I think it also will apply in industries like STEM jobs too. Um, but within the classroom, definitely there's this disconnect between social justice and what engineers need to learn, you know, or like social justice and what a biologist needs to know to go to med school. And it seems as though they're very separate things. I think that might be the first step is to really understand the intersectionality between STEM and social justice. You know, like when we make technological improvements and we try to, to do great things, you can see it now with AI and facial recognition, you know, it, there is in, there's this innate bias in racism that comes with it if we do not address the, the issues early on. You're going to get a subset of engineers, you know, designing things that are going to disproportionately benefit white people if you do not actively teach anti-racism in the classroom for engineers too. Um, and then if you think about you know, med school, right? If you have a bunch of people in STEM aiming to become doctors, you know, it's well documented now that we have racist doctors, a racist healthcare system when, you know, if you consider that STEM for sure, it, those doctors aren't just one day you know, born or, or just like realizing, you know what, I'm just not going to give pain medicine to a black woman. Just like, I'm just going to decide to, no, it's like ingrained in them, you know, and, and it's, and it's part, part of the miseducation. So I think within STEM, there's a lot of overlap that's commonly ignored. And it, also within a company, you know, what, what are the charities the company donates to? What's the financial you know, incentive for safety policies? Are they willing to turn a blind eye for, you know, if it puts a local area that's mostly black in danger versus a local area that's mostly affluent and white in danger? You know, if, if there's different policies or different spending accounts, there's things you can question within the, the, the STEM uh, profession and industry too. But I think it all is rooted in the classroom and really it just comes from a disconnect um, you know, those subjects are objective and not biased. It's really just comes from people who are not wanting and not willing to engage. And you have to tell them there's a big overlap. There's a big overlap. If you want to produce an engineer or you want to produce a scientist that's going to go into the world and make a really, you know, drastic uh, improvement of justice, right? We talk about, in my mind, what's one of our big global or at least national ideals, hopefully, would be that we're all going to be able to peacefully live in a just society, you know, like this the arc of the moral, the moral universe is like bends towards justice, right? To quote MLK, like, if we're going towards justice, we all have a role in that. And if we're deciding that people in STEM are all of a sudden separate from that, and they're going and trying to fix certain problems, but they're not involved in justice at all, then it's a huge disservice to future generations when all of a sudden these technical innovations are oppressive systems that are being created right now from people who have not been taught, you know, anti-racism and things like that. So hopefully that that helps and connects a little bit to your question, Aaron. Also great to see you because Aaron and I are our Villanova chemical engineering uh, 
products of chemical engineering department, I'll say. Okay, thank you for that, Simon. Do we have Aaron? Um, thank you for that. Do you have any more uh, question or comments? Okay, well, if not, I want to thank you guys all so much for participating in this session. We are so glad to have you. Um, if you have any question or comments, um, feel free to email, chat with us. Um, this is going to be posted towards the Freedom School link, so you'll be able to revisit this session at any time, um, which will have the presentation in it. Uh, so thank you all so much for coming. Um, yeah, and like I said, if you have any other questions or comments that you prefer to uh, talk to us about that personally, feel free to email or contact us. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. It's almost so good. Thank to see you. you.